Uh, evening, everybody, and welcome to uh, the first of a series of policy cabinets that we are holding uh, evening, everybody, here at Newcastle welcome City Council. To, uh, the council the takes decisions through its cabinets. cabinet structure, and I'm joined this evening by a number of cabinet members. But unlike business cabinets, where we take specific decisions on specific proposals in front of us, uh, tonight is really an opportunity to open up a debate. Uh, we know that there are real issues affecting young people in the city, and we know that COVID has affected young people over the last two years in a way that no other uh, significant event has in terms of setbacks to their education. And we were very clear when we started to have the conversation about economic recovery that we needed to take our children and young people with us and make sure that we closed the gap that has started to open up. Uh, so today isn't about taking any clear decisions as a council. It's more about discussing, in terms of hearing some experts, to... having uh, the input of young people themselves. Uh, and uh, cabinet members on the call are here to listen to the discussion and absorb the information that uh, the range of partners who are joining this uh, conversation uh, are here to express tonight. Um, just a couple of things about how I'm going to run the meeting. Um, uh, once we get going, and uh, some of you may have been to our previous policy cabinets that we held up until a couple of years ago. Uh, once we get going, I'm going to limit the time of the meeting to an hour. And that really focuses our minds on what are the really important questions. So I'm reliant on all of you to, uh, if you want to make a point, please do so, but use the raise hand function. And please don't repeat points that other people have made. Please make your points succinctly and briefly, and that way we'll cover as much ground as possible. Uh, and I will, from time to time, if I feel we're in danger of violently agreeing with each other, I might just try and be a bit controversial. Uh, so, you know, if I'm being, if I'm challenging or being a bit controversial, that's because I'm being an agent provocateur to keep the conversation going, uh, rather than necessarily ex expressing my own view. And what I'll try and do at the end of the debate is to uh, pull the, the, the main themes together uh, that we need to consider further. Um, so I, I hope that you will find it of uh, value and uh, I hope that uh, you enjoy the discussion. Uh, I, I, I should say it's a, it's a shame in a way that we're not able to meet in person to have this conversation. Uh, it's, it's novel trying to do a conversation like this online and I'll do my best to read the I was going to say read the room, I mean read the screen, um, and uh, to, to chair it as effective as I can. Uh, but um, unlike a real meeting room, I do actually have a mute all function. So uh, if anybody starts to uh, uh, take too long, um, I won't hesitate from, uh, from cutting you off. Um, and as I said, uh, this is not about taking any clear decisions, but this is about helping us to think about how we might develop our approach, not just as a council, but as a city too. Uh, because uh, if it takes a village to raise a child, it takes a city to raise a generation of children and young people. Uh, so to start off then, um, we've actually got the voices of uh, some young people themselves in a video that uh, has been put together to start this meeting off. Uh, uh, so uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking to see who's going to lead this. Robin, are you going to share that with us to start off with? Uh, and, then, um, uh, and, and once we've seen the, 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 the video, I'll ask uh, Joyce McCarthy, who's the cabinet member responsibility for our inclusive economy work, to say a few brief words of introduction, uh, and then I'll open up the discussion with some questions. So thanks, Robin. Okay, I'll share my screen. Hopefully you can see that. Yeah. Um, yep. Sorry, just it started automatically. Just to say that this is um, the, the findings from a range of consultation that we've, we've ta undertaken over the last uh, 12 months, really, uh, through a range of guises.
Thanks. We do hope to have some young people joining us. Um, I don't think we'll be able to join just at the moment, um, but we hope to hear from them uh, live at some point through the discussion. I, I can see a couple of young people on screen. Um, yes, we, we are uh, Rosemary. Hi. So I'm Rosemary. Introduce Charles yourselves. Walters, and I'm here with John and Chris. Do you want to introduce yourselves? Hello. Um, John, I'm a representative from 16 plus. Um, and um and CPAC. Yeah, I am uh, Christopher Butcher. I'm also a, a representative for the plus sixteen uh, leavers group. So just to ask the same questions you've kind of already seen on the screen and get these guys' opinion on it, what do you think it's like finding a job as a young person in Newcastle? Um I kind of think it's since COVID it's went a little bit downhill economically and I feel like it's harder to get a job than last 2019, basically. Well, I'd say like for young people, um, I'd say finding a job right after like they leave their school is quite difficult since they don't really know like all the jobs that are out there. Um, yeah. Yeah. Do you think there is anything that's exciting about finding a job in Newcastle? Um, yeah, because what was the question? Do you think there's anything exciting about finding a job in Newcastle? The prospect of the economical growth is is extraordinary. <laughs> yeah, Chris. I would say like yeah, because they might find a um, might find a job which they might actually enjoy. It could be like their hobby. Um, yeah, or it could be even a good skill as well. Yeah, what do you think the main challenges are? to finding jobs in Newcastle. Um, John, do you want to go first? Employers needing GCS, needing GCSEs, do you unlock them? No schools do GCSEs and some requirements are for GCSEs personally. But yeah, I'd say the challenges um, in like employment is that like sometimes it's hard for someone to know the amount of jobs that's available, uh, which you could learn to do as well as in like college. Yeah. So what do you think would help to sort of overcome those challenges? Um, guidance. Yeah, more guidance. Yeah, more guidance. Yeah, I would say yeah, guidance. Um, oh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, Where would that guidance be? Like in schools or colleges? In schools, or? colleges, job seeker or um, and each field of education. Yeah. And yeah. support workers, the social workers, and stuff like this. High malarkey. Mm. Yeah, I was going to say as well, like probably work experience as well. Mm. Yeah, making it easier to get work experience. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, is that everything? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Bye. John and Chris, before I move on to others, can, do you mind if I ask you a couple of questions? Um, sure. uh, firstly, what kind of jobs would you like to do? Um, I'm, wanted, I'm looking at the IT sector or cyber security or mm. um, editing and stuff. I mean, like right now for me, I'm, like, I'm studying games design at uh, level three and I'm hoping to do like concept art. And do you see yourselves working in or around Newcastle for all of your careers, or do you see yourselves having to move away for promotion opportunities? Yeah. I, oh, sorry, John. You go. I see myself working in Newcastle all my life, and I'd like um, to work in the IT sector in Newcastle, like somewhere that's admin or something or coding and stuff. Yeah, for me, I would say like for start, like for the start with, I probably will be uh, finding a job in Newcastle, but I might like expand my reach in a way, like probably working in London or elsewhere. Fantastic. Um, I'm going to develop the conversation now, but please feel free to, if you if there's anything that you want to make a point on or come back on or uh, feed into, uh, please do just let me know because uh, your voices are the most important voices in this meeting tonight uh, because you're the voices of the future of our city. 
Uh, before I come to Joyce McCarthy, uh, it's good to see John Niblo uh, joining us as well. And John, I know you've worked uh, in, in with, with young people for a long time in Newcastle now. It'd be great to get your take on, uh, in particular, what you what you see the main challenges facing young people uh, seeking employment at the moment. Thanks, Councillor Forbes. Yeah, it's, it's great to be here. Um, just to, to clarify who I am, where I'm from. So I'm John Niblo from an organisation called Any Youth. Um, our history for 85 years has been based in the city, formerly North London Boys Clubs, North London Pubs Young People. We are now sadly across the water in Gateshead, um, but we still deliver services and have member youth organisations across the city. Look, this, this is a, a complex matter dating back many, many years. When I was asked to, to, to be involved tonight, um, I remember the report that, I, that I'd seen. Now, you, the light's not very good in here. This report was written by um, Newcastle YMCA um, and Newcastle University. And it was titled A Generation Without Hope. And it was about the current realities of, of 16 to 25 year olds back in 1986. And some of the stuff I'm reading from then is still relevant now. Um, young people still have a lack of access to information. Um, young people still have, have a lack of aspiration, um, which, which is which is a huge concern. One of the big challenges is lack of connectivity and, I suppose, lack of collaboration around some of those emerging um, labour markets in Newcastle and the North East, particularly um, STEM and tech. I think there's lots of dots that can be joined um, to support young people on those pathways. Um, and lack of a voice, I mean, look, it's great to see the two young people here tonight. Um, it was great that some of our young people in Denton were involved last night um, with Rosie, but there's still a lack of voice um, for, from young people across the city, um, particularly young people from disadvantaged communities and from young people that, that are in most need of um, employment opportunities. Um, and look, we, we've, we're, we're coming through a pandemic, we're still in a pandemic, um, so there's some, some more challenging issues there around sort of mental and, and physical health, which we need to get a grip of. So the, the picture is not great, um, but I think well, certainly the, the conversation tonight and the, the kind of the appetite from, from partners across the city is really strong. And I think together we, we can collectively find some, some solutions and some quick wins to some of these um, difficult challenges for young people. Thanks, John. Uh, and between yourself, John and Chris, you've set out a really clear uh, set of issues that we need to tackle around um, aspiration skills, life skills, knowledge, opportunities, adaptability. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, I, I, one of the questions I want to come on to, and I know we have a, a number of uh, people involved in broadly in the education sector uh, with us tonight. I'd like to come on to have we got the right balance between what you might call life skills and functional skills uh, and uh, be interesting to perhaps uh, tease that debate out a bit. But uh, before I start moving on to other questions, uh, Joyce, you've been working in this space for a while as well, both professionally and politically. It'd be good to get your take on what, what you see the main challenges young people face these days. Uh, uh, thanks, Nick. Uh, that's really helpful. And thank you to all of the partners who joined us, uh, I think, this afternoon. Um, I just first of all want to make a couple of apologies. Some people have asked me why we're focusing on young people this evening, um, because obviously this issue is a, a, a whole life course issue. It's not just about young people. But given the time constraints, I think for today, we've had to narrow that down. And secondly, I know the paper that we've shared today uh, won't reflect everything that is underway in the city. Um, so just to apologise to those whose organisation's work isn't reflected in this. Um, Chair, I think what we're trying to do today is um, give us the opportunity as a city to make sure that every young person has the best possible start to their career, that no one is left behind. Um, and that all of our young people get the support that they need so that they're able to achieve their dreams and their ambitions. Uh, I mean, it's fantastic to have John and Chris here and the words that Robin has shared from other young people, because actually 
seeing all of that makes our conversations much more real, uh, I think, this afternoon. Um, as a council, we've got a really clear vision of our city. We want it to be a great place to be born, a great place to grow up in, a great place to uh, live and to work. And we want our young people to thrive. Um, and we know that that has been a real challenge over the last year. Uh, the pandemic has um, uh, been especially difficult, I think, for our young people. But um, improving the education and the life chances of our young people has been a priority for this council for some years, with or without a, a pandemic. Um, we want our young people to have a love of play, a love of learning, um, engagement in their skills development, and then uh, a career. Uh, all of that is really important, I think, for us. And, and that we have to take into account everyone's particular needs, abilities and background. Uh, and for me, that is our young people's right uh, as a city. So I think today gives us a chance to hear from others, consider what more we can do, uh, what we want to deliver on our ambitious vision for our young people. I think the paper that's before us reflects where we are now. It looks at employment data, vacancies. And I know we've not got time to go into that in any detail. It also reflects a worrying picture on apprenticeships more recently and a clear view that many young people are missing out on the opportunities that are available. We've set out chair the policy context for this, highlighting some of the ways that we are offering um, support for young people through T-levels or apprenticeships or the career service or the work of the Department for Work and Pensions. Uh, and other partners, of course, offering that support. Um, it sets out the um, government's response through Kickstart and how we're supporting that, and support from coaches uh, that are employed by the DWP. There's targeted work going on across North of Tyne, as uh, many colleagues will know. The details about the support from the LEP and the Combined Authority are included. Um, and what is really helpful, I think, in the policy paper before us tonight are the case studies that make real some of the uh, opportunities for support that our young people are being offered. I'm really delighted that the Youth Hub is now there um, to help our young people in the city, that the Skills Hub in the library is now open for business. Uh, you know, it's been tough because that uh, online support is obviously not accessible to everyone who needs it. Um, I, I do say to the young people who are um, with us this evening, you do have to make an appointment, um, but you can do that by phone or by email. Um, and I think Newcastle City Learning is trying to work hard to support that employability, uh, those employability skills alongside all of the other learning uh, that's offered there. Uh, Chair, we really value the work of Newcastle Futures, which is a unique partnership between the Council and the DWP um, and the work that they do in supporting those who are furthest from work. Uh, the college is continuing to do teaching and support programmes, both virtually and in person where they can. And of course, our two universities are fantastic in continuing to offer support and encouragement to our young people, not just in their academic achievement, but also offering internships and other opportunities um, through there too. In the paper, we set out our key issues and concerns, as well as some of the ways we as a council will respond. Um, Chair, it's fair to say that the council are not responsible for all of this work, what, but what we can do is um, use our ability to convene and work with our partners uh, to bring people together to do all we can to improve the situation for our young people. Uh, so I think I'd, we'd like to hear from others about whether this approach is right, the gaps, the areas that we've missed and have um, a further conversation over the next hour uh, to help guide us in the work as we take this forward. Thank you, Nick. Thanks, Joyce. That's really helpful to hear and see in the paper the, the range of support that's available. Uh, of course, there's a difference between having support available and people being able to access it or know how to access it. And I think that may be one of the themes that uh, comes out of tonight. Uh, we've heard a bit from young people. We've heard their own voices. We've heard the work of uh, uh, the, 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 the work done by young people in terms of the, the video that Robin played. Uh, I'd now like to get a, an employer perspective on the, the, the challenges facing employers in recruiting young people uh, and providing um, apprenticeships and opportunities and uh, sorry to pick on you John but can I can I come to you first uh, John from the Northeast Chamber of Commerce thanks uh, thanks Nick and yeah, good afternoon evening uh, everyone um, 
I probably won't dwell too much on on the pandemic, but I think you know, given the context of the discussion tonight, it's it's important to note just what a tough time um, the vast majority of businesses have been through over the last um, eighteen months. And you know, we saw alongside the overnight drop in, uh, in sort of um, sales orders and business activity, a, a corresponding overnight drop in in recruitment activity. Um, now it is really pleasing to see that that is that is picking back up again and um actually the story now in terms of of the labor market is that um we've got lots of businesses out there that are really struggling to fill the vacancies that they've got um i think we are still in a difficult period however for for a lot of businesses um who may well want to to, to do the right thing I mean, take on a young person offering a training scheme apprenticeship something like that and, and actually still being a little bit uncertain about what their future might hold um, and, and therefore not necessarily wanting to, to commit um, so it's conversations I had with plenty of employees during the pandemic of almost they, 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 they stopped their apprenticeships out of a, almost a, a moral perspective of not wanting to take someone halfway along the journey and having to, to, to lose them because because business disappeared. Um, hopefully economy continues going in the right direction and, and, and that problem will abate. Um, I think actually where, where we come at this issue um, it is is in many respects from a similar angle to what we've heard from from the young people in the sense that um, for many businesses they find it hard to understand how to engage with um, the careers system, particularly SMEs um, at, at all levels. So I'm talking um, at school, college, um, even through to university level. Uh, businesses do sometimes struggle to understand how do I get access to to the people who who I might want to recruit. Um, the system itself, um, when it comes to things like apprenticeships and training courses, can often be consuming, uh, time-consuming, bureaucratic uh, for for a business to, uh, to to engage with. Again, particularly, you know, the, the smaller the business, typically, um, the, the the greater the, the chance that they have. Um, but there is a huge appetite out there. So we we at the chamber, um, prior to the pandemic, and, and indeed a couple of times during it. Um, Ran a series of successful events where essentially we used our skills in, in sort of putting on business networking events to bring businesses and schools together um, in a room to meet, make contacts and, and discuss how they could help one another. Uh, and you know, it's 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 a bit of a cliche, but that that sense of and it was in one of the the, the quotes that was in the video and um, that sense that work experience is is your typical one week one week photocopying. I'm sure many of us did um, is is a thing of the past. Um, but what we also have to recognise for many businesses, offering work experience on their site is a very difficult thing to do. And the more um, broad the range of opportunities there are for businesses to talk to young people, tell them what's needed, what decisions they might need to take at different points in their career, what actually working in their business involves, um, the more um, you know, the, the more real, I guess, they they can make it. Um, in terms of uh, some of the work that we have done, um, we actually ran a project with, um, sadly again, the other side of the water, but, but with um, one of our partners, Gateshead College, where we did a very similar exercise to this and, and put young people and employees in, in the same room. Um, and, and actually, um, one thing that came out very strongly was was often young people, not necessarily lacking, but, but not necessarily being able to demonstrate. I don't want to use the term soft skills, but actually, I guess, kind of business applicable skills, simple things like sending an email, um, which, um, you know, I, I suspect for a lot of young people um, is is quite an old fashioned way of communicating. But no doubt for many of us is an absolutely integral part of um, integral part of their, their job. And it would think it was felt that actually those are so it's not about communication. It's not necessarily about selling yourself. Lots of young people have the confidence to do that. But they don't necessarily have to do it in an email or a word document um, because actually things have things have moved on since then um i think the other thing we would recommend um it goes back to my point about business engagement um is we would absolutely applaud the great work that's been done in this region around um, around careers guidance about making that as embedded in everyday learning um as it as it possibly can be um so what young people are learning is directly applicable to the careers that they will ultimately pursue um rather than your monthly weekly termly meeting with with a careers advisor um that actually every single time you're learning something you're thinking how might this translate to where i go in the future um because I know as, as formerly somebody who worked in recruitment and indeed somebody who's hired many people during my time in the chamber, um, 
the person that it's often that not the person who gives the best example in their interview but the person who can readily use any example from their life and to answer your question um in the interview and make things applicable and sure that you're learning um so i wanted to focus more on that than, than necessarily the sort of technical skills that are in demand um because i think we're all aware of, of where the sort of um booming industries are or high potential industries are in in the city um and actually, I think on, on the sort of technical side, software coding, things like that, we've heard already there's a huge appetite from, from young people. Um, final thing I will say, though, because I'm really, really um, personally quite quite passionate about this as well, um, is we can't consider these issues in, in isolation. So if you were to look at something like the low carbon net zero industry energy sector, um, there are many, many barriers that will prevent young people from getting jobs in that. And it's not lack of application or skill on their part. It's not a lack of desire from employers. It could well be their socioeconomic status, their background, complicating factors. Um, and if we don't think about these things in the round, um, that will naturally limit business growth because unfortunately they will have to look elsewhere for their talent. Jonathan, that's really, really helpful and covered quite a lot of points there. Can I play back to you something that uh, the, some of the young people in that film that we saw earlier said, which is that uh, employers often employ somebody with more experience rather than a young person because they know they've got the kind of skills that the employer needs. I've also heard exactly the opposite expressed, which is that employers are more likely to employ young people rather than older people because they're cheaper. Um, do you think there's any truth in either of those perceptions? I'm, I'm going to dodge the question slightly and say yes and no on both counts. Um, the, you know, inevitably it's a case by case basis. Um, I think, you know, if ultimately what you have to remember as an employer going to the market is they want someone who will do the job. Um, and, and their assessment of who will do the job can often be shaped by their own background, who they currently employ, um, and, and the, the nature of the organisation. Um, I think in, in times where there is a plentiful supply of labour, um, often there is a, a conflation of experience and skills. Um, I, I think as, as absolutely tough a time as it has been for, for young people um, during the pandemic, and we know they have absolutely borne the brunt of, of the spikes in unemployment, um, there is potentially coming around the corner a real opportunity for young people with, with the right skills, um, because young uh, businesses are going to have to go out there and look for them. Um, one one trend we are seeing when you mention pay is, is quite clearly um, the pandemic has shown that lots of jobs that were maybe previously kind of quite location based um, can now be done from anywhere uh, in the country. As a result, that's that's a, a double edged sword. Um, we could potentially have some great jobs based in the northeast, um, but also we could lose some high quality people to jobs based elsewhere in the country, probably paying higher rates um, than we can here. Um, what I would say in terms of my advice to, to, to young people is, is exactly what I said before. Um, it's not just about saying I've got the GCSEs, A-levels, certificates, whatever it might be. It's how is that applicable to the job that I'm applying for? So don't don't assume actually that the employer has asked for certain qualification and you've got it and therefore you'll get the job. Actually, how how does that make you a good employee and how will you use that? Because you are going to be up against people who've got something on their CV that maybe you don't have. That's really interesting. Thanks so much, Jonathan. And and uh, Lisa, uh, Lisa, are you on the? I think you're on the call. It'd be interesting to hear a perspective from the hospitality sector, particularly because that can sometimes, quite often, be a a sort of uh, entry for young people into the world of work. Uh, uh, the, the kind of jobs that are, are on offer. Uh, yeah. Be good to get your sense of what it's looking like and what what the challenges that your your sector faces. Yeah, I think at the moment the, it's a two pronged attack for us. We're, we're not getting many young people in to interview. They're not coming through the doors. So I'm not sure if that's a then there's no ignition for the passion for the industry and actually um, that it's the, the, the kind of jobs that are the industry that isn't perceived very well. I was saying earlier on the call when we just started that the perception is of one level of what it is. Actually, there's a lot of branches and places to go. But how can we? get that across to young people so that they understand it's not just somebody coming in as a waiter or waitress that there is quick progression in our industry it's very quick but you do have to start somewhere so how can we engage with those people to be able to sort of get that across but we, we, do they know where to find the jobs you know do they know how to apply um i think that's that's the main thing i think we, we've sort of historically had a bad reputation for being long hours low pay and and actually that's 
that table's turned. You know, we're we're all committing to the hospitality charter, which is a, a really good thing. You know, largely around won't go into it hugely, but largely around work life balance and really putting the industry out there as a you know a good career choice. But I think from our point of view, it's how do we certainly as an association, how is best for us to engage with those people to be able to explain that? Um, because I think it is that we teach we don't need a lot of skills we just need somebody who can engage um, you know in most of the roles some of them you know they just need to be able to have a chat with their colleagues you know it's a really easy going industry to be honest um but we do offer a lot of training so yeah i think that's our main issue is we're just not getting people through the door i agree jonathan with your point with regard to the apprenticeships i think they can be quite difficult to navigate um a lot of the time which i think is maybe why some sort of hospitality outlets maybe don't always go down that avenue. I think Kickstart's been great, but there's been a very mixed sort of response of candidates that we're getting through that scheme. Um, but to be honest, I don't think it, it, it lies at our door as well as an industry as, as how we can sort of ignite that passion because um, there's a lot of great things about hospitality, but it's it's getting to the children or the getting to the younger people at the right time to be able to sort of engage them in it and explain how good it can be and how quickly you can progress in the industry Two things like it social media what you know what's already been mentioned it's not just rooms and serving drinks you know there's a there's a whole plethora of roles available that i think often are overlooked in hospitality to be honest uh, thanks lisa uh, again really interesting perspective and uh I know one of the conversations that I had with Jed Bell uh, many years ago, uh, which was a real light bulb moment for me, was when Jed was saying that the hospitality sector is not a low skill uh, uh, sector. It, it, it requires really skillful people. It's just they're not paid very well. And uh, the, the, the opportunity to progress uh, is there. Um, but uh, a lot of people don't necessarily see that in the sector and it doesn't necessarily always have that kind of level of uh, support. Uh, yes. So it, they're, they're the kind of jobs that actually, you know, can be a bit of a kind of stereotype that they're sort of student summer jobs, but actually uh, they, they, they are, there is real career progression, isn't there? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, just looking at myself, started as a started, you know, waitressing or whatever, the way you do and ended up as a general manager very, very quickly, you know, doing it quite a long time. And I think other people can can do that if they've got the willingness to work. That's all we need. We, um, it's it's not low pay anymore. You know, we, we, we are moving in the right direction. Um, and certainly just because somebody's a younger person doesn't mean they're any less better at that role. So I certainly pay anybody that comes here. We've got a couple of 16 year olds that work with us. They're paid the same as everybody else that does that job. And I think that's really important to get across that it's not just because they're young. We want to pay less. I don't think that's um, the right thing to do at all. And again, that's where the hospitality charter comes in. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I guess. Uh, one of the actually let me let me just let me just pick up on something that that hasn't been spoken about yet but i know is something that people have talked a lot about uh in particularly as a result of covid and, and that's the growing issue of mental health uh in the workplace and challenges that uh young people in particular face uh, from a mental health perspective uh and uh, what i'd really like to get a sense of and please do feel free to say, come in on this if you if you want to. I'd really like to get a sense of how much of a barrier that is, both from a young person's perspective in terms of getting on in the world, but also from an employer point of view in terms of feeling that it might hold people back. Lisa, do you want to come back in on that? Yeah, I think I think that is becoming a bit of a. It is a. It is a challenge. It is prevalent in the industry and in every industry. I mean, the way we kind of combat it is we, we do a lot around mental health. We do a lot of mental health well-being weeks within our sort of annual calendar of events, if you like. And they all sort of go around physical, mental, you know, there's sort of four areas that we do those around. So we take it quite seriously. Um, but I think, you know, the, the, a way to sort of assist with that is to work somewhere you really enjoy. Um, and if somebody comes and enjoys where they work, then actually that's a benefit to your mental health as well. So I think there's a big element of if people can get, can, you know, apply for the jobs, come into the jobs, actually they might really quite enjoy it. And that in itself is 
is a help because all of a sudden you're you feel you feel part of something you feel like you belong to something bigger and all of a sudden that has a really positive effect on your mental health so if we can get right get it right from the beginning and try and get some younger people in i just think that just the very part that as a section of itself will, would would help that i'm not saying it would alleviate it at all but i think it would be a, a step in the right direction for sure uh, thanks lisa um I, I... John and Chris, uh, I, I know you've got your camera turned off, but have you got a perspective on mental health and whether your uh, peers worry about it? Oh, can you repeat that, please? Yeah, just just wondering what you know what 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 people uh, you know your you and your friends think about mental health and whether you see it as a real barrier or something that uh, is there's there's a lot less stigma and people are much more willing to talk about it these days. Yeah, um, I think from an employability point of view, it needs more mental health support around jobs that are more mentally challenging, such as a police officer or a train driver who runs someone over. I know it's a bit extreme, but um, the council, these counselling something, they need that support to do the job properly. Thanks. Uh, John, sorry to come pick on you again, but you know, have, is it, have you seen a change over the last few years? Or actually, again, is it one of these things where there's a difference between perception and reality? Uh, hmm. I've seen a change, but I haven't seen enough of a change yet. We need to do more around mental health, then it's the biggest barrier, I would say. OK. Um, before I start going on to other questions, uh, I can see at least one hand up. So uh, if you want to make a kind of more general point uh, on what we've just talked about, please do uh, put your hand up and I'll bring you in. Stephen Lambert first. Thanks, Nick. Um, I'm finding this quite interesting, the way this discussion is going. Uh, I just want to focus in on a couple of issues and pick up what some of the young people had said earlier. Uh, clearly, youth unemployment is a pressing concern both in this city and also some of the so-called de-industrial towns across the northeast. But what tends to happen is the official youth unemployment figures tends to disguise probably, I suspect, a higher number of people who the academics refer to as NEETs, those not in employment, education or training. They're not a homogenous group, but what we do know is that they do tend to be drawn from predominantly disadvantaged backgrounds. Now, we know there are challenges, uh, economic opportunities arguably through the pandemic are scarce, but there are three key barriers um, from the research that I'm familiar with. A is the mental health issue, which you rightly raised, but also one of the issues that the young people brought up was the lack or the perceived absence of social support and there's been a lot of research done by a colleague of mine who I used to work with some years ago he's seen as a bit of an expert on needs and youth unemployment Robin Simmons based on Huddersfield University and he's done a lot of work on this and he takes the view that having a learning mentor is one way a very effective way of getting marginalized young people from disadvantaged backgrounds to access employment at well more so mainstream education and training now i know newcastle college years ago had a good reputation for providing learning mentors these were for, mostly for young people doing a levels and btech type qualifications but this is a one sure way of trying to re-engage disadvantaged young people and getting them back into some form of vocational education that's my second point i'll be dead quick nick the third point, another barrier, clearly, which has been identified is, is financial, is grants, bursaries. Now, certainly Newcastle bucks the trend here. We do provide bursaries. Uh, they're not as generous, generous as they used to be when we had the old EMA scheme. I mean, Scotland and Wales, for instance, uh, give bursaries of about £30 a week. I mean, ours is considerably lower, but that can be often be perceived to be a barrier uh, for disaffected young people uh, trying to get back into mainstream education. 
So they're my points. The guy's called Robin Simmons. If you want to familiarise yourself with some of the field work he's done, uh, it's pretty illuminating stuff, actually. I, okay, I, think, I, I, I think you've sent me a couple of his articles over the years. Have I? <laughs> I think you probably have, yes. Um, so we, 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 we've, we've heard a, 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 an employer perspective, uh, or some employer perspectives. Um, can I now move on to look at what's happening in the broader public sector and how the um, uh, uh, different agencies are joined up and what the scope for further uh, joined up work might be? Uh, Claire from DWP, can I come to you first for some thoughts? Hi, uh, yeah, just put my camera on. Hi, uh, yeah, um, within within DWP, we have started working much more closely with um, Newcastle Local Authority and the Combined Authority. And we do have, a, a currently have a joint um, partnership to tackle some joint priorities. Um, we are, we're all looking at the challenges of young people and the providers to see how we can work together. I mean, we, we are looking to do some customer insights, so it's be really interested to hear from the young people today, because it is very early days um, with the Youth Employer Partnership, but it is about the offer. We need to resonate with the young people to engage and develop them to move into employment. Uh, one of our key challenges, which we've already discussed, we'll not spend too long on it, is those young people because of COVID um, and the knock-on effects and the confidence, anxiety and mental health. We're also hoping to look at a bit more about digital exclusion. And we're hoping that the insight will give us more info on the levels of that. And obviously, we have our Kickstart um, offer for young people, which we've worked quite closely with some providers and some gateways. Um, and that offer has now been extended to March, which has given young people some excellent opportunities across a wide range of sectors. I think what it has shown us is nobody can achieve this on our own. It's all about working together and to simplify the processes for young people to help them move forward. We do have a very clear youth offer within DWP, um, which is a 13-week journey for um, people who are closer to work. And we do have dedicated work coaches who deal with those who are further away or have any complex complex needs. Um, and we we'll also have some youth hubs across um, the city. So, I think by working together, we are starting to achieve some, hopefully, some better outcomes for our young people in the area. Uh, thanks, Claire, and, and thanks for the, thanks for standing in for Sandra tonight, uh, who I know is uh, not able to be here. Uh, can I now go to um, Jill Hewitson? Because Jill, you've been working in this space between a number of different organisations and co pulling together in what Joyce described as you know, a, a unique arrangement, the Castle Futures arrangement. Uh, it'd be very interesting to get your perspective on um, how well you think things work in Newcastle compared to other places, but also where some of the gaps might be that we need to think about uh, in the future. Well, I'm obviously going to think it's really good in Newcastle because that's where we work. Uh, just to sort of say we're, we're very much in the employability space and working with DWP and all the partners. And I, I would just like to pick up on what, a couple of things about the speakers over said, not to repeat, but John mentioned research from, from way back, which was the millennial kind of youth research. And what's really, um, uh, you know, exciting is that that millennials are now they are the people who are serving these young people. We call them Generation Z, that, that they're the ones that's coming through. Uh, and I would say one of the things that we've found, and because all the stuff in the paper we found, we it reflects very much what our experience of young people is. But one of the other things is, you've got to remember these are very young people and they're not uh, mature. And obviously, when people go to work, you mature. That's what we all do. Some of us mature much quicker, you know, and, uh, you know, but but I do think, uh, uh, as Councillor Lambert says, what they are uh, responding quite uh, well to is clear mentorship because they need somebody who cares about them as an individual. This is a very individual uh, generation, as the millennials were, and they need all this information. There's a stack of information out there, too much, really, and we have to filter it down and make it unique to those individuals because they're not hearing it it's just too much it's like an overload so 
you know, services like ourselves and the colleges, we try and make that journey customised. You know, even when you see some of the universities, their marketing slogan was a unit, your own university experience, making it very clear it's about them. And I think that's what they need. They need to be seen in it because a lot of times they need to see role models. They don't see themselves, you know, some of the fabulous jobs in hospitality. They'll have never seen some of the young people we work with. And just for an example, I can remember one young man who worked with one of our advisors. He took him for a cup of coffee, got him a latte and a glass, a glass cup. And the young man couldn't believe you could get a coffee in a glass. He'd just never seen that, you know, and so to us, that's just nothing. But these are young people and sometimes from backgrounds that have never experienced that. So the, the kickstart's been great for a lot of people where they've experienced things they would never do. But I think one of the cause now is we've got to learn this generation. You know, it's a learning day for us every day to understand their needs and what we can provide. But equally, the market is such a fast paced, agile, uh, unpredictable kind of place, marketplace. And employers, you know, when there's a great demand as there is, you know, this they're, they're so good at, you know, really taking a risk and experimenting, which is a great, a great space to be in. And I think it's that about looking at the methods we're using to recruit, because one size just does not fit all. And you know, having a, an application online you know, these young people just aren't getting anywhere further than the application. They fall short. And that, the, everybody talks about the experience and calls. Often we have people with calls and no experience, experience and no calls. And that's the other thing. If education has failed the young person, they still be able to do it. We, you know, there's, there's plenty of people uh, that we can quote who have got fabulous careers and haven't got their qualifications, but they've had to have a start somewhere. And I think, you know, we have to look at things like psychometric testing, new new methods. It's, that's not a new method, but it takes somebody's aptitude and talent and fits them in rather than the regular. I know it's low cost often, but it isn't in the long run to have a recruitment service that really, you know, you, you, you get a lot of applications, you know, a lot of applic applicants who say they're going to send. Indeed, we'll see the there's a lot of applications coming in and you actually end up with three. I think we have to be creative in this space now to hit the demand, be ready for the new markets that's coming along and work closer with employees than we've ever done before. We've always wanted to, but I think now it's just a must. Um, thanks, Gillian. And uh, I, I can tell you from first hand experience, because I've done a lot of recruitment over the years, often to some quite senior jobs. Uh, and one of the things that always slightly is, takes me by surprise is actually how generally poor people's CV writing skills are, uh, and uh, you know even even there I said at some of the highest levels of uh, public service, uh, it's not unusual to see some really badly written CVs and some basic things like spelling mistakes and stuff like that. Uh, so you know this 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 is a set of skills that I think everybody needs to understand is valuable, and there's also something that you said, but also I think that's something that Jonathan Walker uh, touched on earlier. There's a bit of a paradox because um, we know that actually the more important skills are the life skills, communication, adaptability, flexibility, being able to make sense of complex information, being able to navigate a, a, you know, a world where you've got lots of things being thrown at you all the time in terms of how you take information in. But actually, most of our skills system is geared towards functional skills and technical skills, uh, which are the kind of things that are important in the job, but actually they're the things that most people can learn over time, whereas we don't tend to find ways of investing in those sort of more life skills, if, if you like. And that, that feels to me like part of the paradox that we're discussing here, uh, that one of the barriers to success is the uh, the 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 the, the, the ever-present life challenges that people face, but we've still got a skill system which very heavily talks about uh, qualifications and task-based approaches. Uh, and so how, there's a question in my mind around what can we do as a city to sort of compensate for that? Uh, and some of it has to be about the connections that we make, but some of it has to be about uh, the, uh, the other opportunities that uh, young people are provided with. Uh, so, uh, Miriam, uh, I, I know 
you've again you've you've done work in this space Miriam Jameson uh, be really interesting to get a ta uh, your take and actually would you mind explaining what UXL is to people who might not have heard of it yeah Newcastle UXL um, actually represent apprenticeship and training provision across the city um, we wear a number of hats we deliver a program into schools which is um, the Department for Education funded apprenticeship support and knowledge for schools programme. So that's providing um, information into schools, into secondary schools for young people, teachers, parents, carers, anyone really who uh, is supporting those young people um, about apprenticeships, pathways to apprenticeships um, and workshops supporting young people and all of these things we've been talking about today, such as CV writing, how to write an application, all of that, that um, those sorts of activities. We do work closely with providers and with a lot of people, um, referral agencies as well. We are um, part of the Skills Hub group and we find that great because there are a number of different um, organisations there who work with different groups of people. So there's a lot of um, opportunity to refer to each other for the best provision for, for that individual young person, which again, I, I very much agree with, you know, this individualised support is so important because one size doesn't fit all. Um, and very often we may see those young people we've met in schools at a later date um, when they've left school and maybe don't have a destination. So we'll support them into um, appropriate destinations as well. But I think my one of the points I wanted to make that that has come across a lot um, during this discussion is about the different programmes. There is a wealth of provision in Newcastle um, for young people to access, but some of it is difficult for particularly the group we work with. We focus very much on the 16 to 18 group. So programmes like Kickstart are not necessarily accessible to those young people because they're not um, they're not claiming universal credit in their own right, so that, that isn't accessible to them. We have traineeships for a, a fantastic opportunity to develop work experience, the skills that employers are looking for. But we find that a lot of the traineeship provision is aimed at 19 plus young people. So my real concern is the 16 to 18 um, young people and I think the other thing I really wanted to mention was the influencers of those young people as well. We can give those young people all of the information about the opportunities that are out there. Um, we can support them in their career decision making but a lot of them are influenced by others so it's really how much do the influencers know about about the opportunities that are out there, about the growth sectors, where the jobs are going to be for their young people in the future. Um, and I think that's a, a big concern for me. How do we get that information to the influencers? When you talk about influencers, Miriam, are you talking about you know, think, you know, social media, things like that? Or are you talking about more, more closely peer pressure amongst groups of young people who've grown up in the same community and don't necessarily see the world beyond it? Um, the, yes, you know, family, carers, support workers, you know, anyone really who has some influence over that young person. If I can give an example, um, we have had young people come to us saying, I'm looking for an apprenticeship. What would you like to do? I don't know. Um, I want an apprenticeship, but I don't know what I want to do. Or we get examples of, I want to trade. What type of trade? Oh, I don't know, plumber, electrician. Why? Because my family tell me a trade's the best thing to have, but they don't necessarily understand what those trades are or understand that there are other opportunities out there, that their skills 
um, and attributes might suit better, or that they may have a, a better opportunity of finding a career in. So again, I think it's very much about um, everyone's knowledge, really, of the um, of the sectors that are out there and the opportunities. That's a really great link into the next big question, uh, which is about how we make sure that education skills and employment pathways are better uh, joined up and how we ensure that uh, the investment in education, training and skills meets the needs of young people uh, and employers. Um, Lucy, sorry to pick directly on you, but you, you see the world from a couple of different perspectives, Northumber University and also the left. It would be really interesting to get a, 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 your, your, your input here. OK, um, thank you, Nick. I, I, I'll start wearing my university hat as Pro Vice Chancellor for uh, Partnerships and Employability at Northumbria. And a couple of reflections. I think, first of all, um, and I think also my colleague Gareth Trainer from Newcastle University is on the call, we would accept that higher education, university study is not for everybody. Um, we would also say it's not a competition FE versus higher education and that the way that the world is going, this is all about partnerships. And that's partnerships between universities and the council working together. It's partnerships with schools and FE and um, particularly the universities and FE um, partnerships. I would say it has to be meaningful and not a sort of parent child approach to it. And I think that is the way forward. I think what we're really lucky um, about in Newcastle is the two very, very strong universities, both of whom have really good track records on graduate outcomes. We have to do a survey every year, um, the Graduate Outcome Survey, and both of us have fared very well um, in the last survey. Uh, it's a retrospective look, but both universities in, in your city are doing something right about making sure that our students get graduate level jobs. And I think I would give strong messages out to the young people um, in this city that there are great graduate level jobs out there. And for those who think, oh, university's not for me, we both universities will do a huge amount of work. Miriam nailed it for me, the influencers. So we work with preschool families to try and encourage girls particularly, but not exclusively girls, to think about the STEM subjects, science, technology, engineering, maths, um, all of these subjects, so that they don't come home and say, Daddy, I want to be an engineer, and Daddy says, don't be silly, Jenny, girls don't do science. That's an example of influencing that the universities do in a really, a really early stage. And both universities will have measures from pre five, will have primary school, will have 11 plus, and will have different levels of influence and in, in working together in partnership. And once they're with us, we want, or rather to get them, we also want say, the, the widest mix. We don't want all of our students to come from the same socioeconomic background. We want to get the very best young people from the Northeast and elsewhere who have that potential. So I think there's a lot of work to do about, uh, and this is where the LEP comes in, Nick, about um, really promoting the great quality graduate level jobs and the graduate careers that people can have here. And you need strong clusters and you need strong sectors because young people joining the firm at the start of their life, they don't think they're going to be in the same job for 30 years. They are going to want to move around. So they're going to want to see progression within the firms they join, but within the sectors as well. So I think there's a lot to be done there. I think the other quote for me of the evening is from Claire, and that's, um, no one can achieve this on their own. And I think that's very important that the universities working with the collaborations I've talked about, centres like the Into Centre that Newcastle and Northumbria are putting up in Walker to really focus on young people there to, to promote opportunities. That's all sort of part and parcel of the partnership working. The other message I'd like to give to um, the young people who'd be listening to this is, um, well, to all of our, my students, I would say, the law of London and the big cities is great. If you take the career that I had before I came uh, into this world at the university, I was a lawyer. Great big flash salaries in London. My goodness, what sort of life did these young people have in these big firms and what sort of cost? Whereas if you look at the quality of work for a really snazzy law firm in the northeast of England, you might be on a lower salary, but your rent is so less. You can buy a property so sooner. 
uh, so much sooner. But that whole quality of life thing um, becomes very important. So I think the, the law of the big city needs just a little look at um, to understand the gloss around that. Um, I think probably those are the key points to stress that also, I should say, degree apprenticeships, um, fantastic offer that both universities offer in the Northeast. Again, it's an alternative. And we shouldn't think about universities just as being pure undergraduate programs for young people aged 18. Um, of course, universities for everybody at any age, but anyone can come back and join us. But I know that we're very focused on the young. But degree apprenticeships have been a great success for particularly for us at Northumbria. Uh, and again, cementing great relationships with business. It, I'm so old, Nick, to remember it was called learn while you earn. Um, but but the, the concept of that is the same. Uh, and finally, I want to say something about the skills that you touched on earlier. Are we educating our students to have what you call, I think, the life skills or the functional skills? And I'm going to give you a, an it depends answer. So I will talk to particular business leaders. Let's take an area of mechanical engineering, something like that, when they do require very specific skills and they may be looking for students who have degrees in physics and so on. But for every one of them, I will speak to probably 10 who say we want these life skills. So embedded in our programs are not just the technical skills that you would have as a lawyer, an engineer, a teacher, but those skills that we've talked about throughout communication, compassion, team working, um, that, that attitude is really important. And very finally, I want to go back to bar work and shop work. So when I used to work in my old law firm and be responsible for the graduate recruitment programme, I might look at the students who had done um, a week's work experience in, in dad's business, which was a barrister's chambers or a solicitor's firm, and I'd be a bit suspicious about that because I hadn't worked to get that opportunity. I'd be much more interested about the young people presenting for their training contract who had worked not once, but two years, but three years, but four years in a cafe or a restaurant or a bar, particularly as they were able to explain to me that they'd learnt the responsibility. They were, because if they were good, communication skills are what we need. They were trusted to cash up at the age of 19. That's a big thing, trust, responsibility. Um, so I would always say, it doesn't matter. You may think that some careers are not for you because you don't know anything about it, but the experience of volunteering and the experience of bar work and all of that, for me, is vitally important because it's back to the, that life skills. Thanks, Nick. Uh, thanks, Lucy. Again, really valuable perspectives. And uh, Gareth, can I come to you from a Newcastle University perspective? And, and, and also, um, now, I, I, I remember a figure from uh, Newcastle University from a couple of years ago that, that said that about, I think it was about a quarter of the graduates of Newcastle University aren't going into employment. They're setting up their own businesses or being self-employed, uh, which is actually a really interesting perspective on the labour market that we tend to overlook uh, when we're thinking about career opportunities. Yeah, thank you, um, Nick, because actually that was, um, my hand was just, my virtual hand was just reaching the air to say that actually um, the the self-employed or rather the sort of enterprising perspective on, on the subjects that we've been talking about this evening, I think also provides a different way of thinking about solving what, you know what we're here to solve um and and lucy put it excellently in terms of the um university uh, position and 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 how we work together and with the college and with the city um with regards to um uh, sort of uh, accessing graduate level work but i think it is also worth mentioning um uh, the, the 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 outputs that our students have in terms of creating graduate level work we'll we'll often talk as a university um partnership about um you know creating employable graduates but also creating graduate employers and i think possibly the the statistic you're referencing is a combined one between the two universities uh, if you look at the um startups that we have um assisted over the years and that still trade um, uh, across the country, across the world, but actually 70 to 80% of them in the Northeast, 
Um, the combined turnover, the combined investment that these firms are raising, and, and crucially, the combined number of jobs that they're creating um, are, is more than uh, many other university areas and university cities in the country. In fact, we're the only city to have both of its the two universities in the top five of that particular league table. And I suppose one of the things that I, I, um, um, I'm interested in here is you know how you apply that thinking across the problem that we're that we're looking at. So the the young people on the call and 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 in the research rightly talk about how difficult it is to find work experience. Uh, and when they found work experience opportunities, how to access those work experience opportunities. Changing the conversation a little bit, um, you know, i.e. that's a that's a, you know we need to look at that, but just to add further to the debate, you know, what can we do to help these young people create their own work experience opportunities? And you know, there are ways to um, facilitate with with sponsor from business, from 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 the public sector, from schools, involving these young people in the creation of community ventures, social ventures, all of which are sort of work to build agency um, for, for these young people. And that kind of brings me on to one other point that we we I know that um, happens at both universities. And that is the extent, and it's been touched on here, and that's that's the extent to which peer groups can support each other. And the point about individualizing the question or the or the problem solving um, and 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 the assistance with that is a really, really valid one. One of the one of the more effective things that we've seen in terms of helping people become employable that are in higher education is peer coaching. And that's where, you know, we might take um, perhaps year 12, year 13 or, or year 11 um, students, train them in in coaching and mentoring techniques and, and have them work with younger um, age groups in the school system to actually help the younger people reflect on what they've got rather than what they haven't got um and and how those attributes those life experiences might be of value to somebody um uh, and and if we arrive at a situation where we've found those points of influence the education system and certainly the university system and the council can help to move those young people into a situation in which they can actually use those strengths um, to solve problems. So, you know, the classic in this case would be just as I think um, uh, John from from the the chamber was outlining in Gateshead. You know, can we together facilitate um, you know some design thinking amongst the young people that sets them the question? You know, what would the city have to look like for you to feel like you were able to progress your career thinking and actually facilitate their their thought creation and maybe implement some of their solutions because. You might not be able to talk about the work experience that you've got or the qualification that you've got, but if our young people can talk about the impact that they've had in their community, in their school, in their neighbourhoods, um, you know, you start opening up a, a really interesting um, conversation. And also the other thing that we're looking at in the universities as we're becoming increasingly diverse places um, is the power of cognitive diversity. Um, and actually, this recognizes the value of each person's lived experience, and it facilitates the use of that insight to solving some of the world's problems and making sure that the lenses that we look through to solving the world's problems or the city's problems aren't just white, male, heterosexual ones. They are, they are actually broad and building diversity as a strength to create to create better solutions for everybody. And of course, youth, young people, areas of disadvantage, areas of prosperity are all lenses in which we should be trying to facilitate some sort of recognition on that. So the gen, so it's support, I think, for um, good, uh, rec you know, ways in which we can achieve great graduate outcomes but it's also a recognition that we've got a role in supporting the creation of your own opportunity and that relies on understanding what your values are what your strengths are and having an infrastructure and an opportunity to put them to test and trial in a supportive environment where your peers and your educators can help you with the failures because actually encouraging more failures might actually lead to greater successes uh, in the longer term and, uh, and, and I know that both universities 
uh, and the college are committed to to helping wherever you think we can um, to facilitate some of these scenarios. Uh, thanks so much, Gareth. Uh, I, again, a really, really interesting set of issues uh, to uh, get out onto the table for the discussion. And uh, just, a, just a reminder, I said that we'd discuss this for an hour and our hour is rapidly approaching. So uh, I want to come very briefly to Judith for a final comment about how we uh, 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 ensure that no, child, no, no young people lose out as a result of COVID and the work that the council's leading on this to convene things within the city. Uh, then I'll come to anybody who wants to make any final points and then I'll try and pull things together. So hopefully uh, we should be concluded in the next uh, four or five minutes or so. Uh, so Judith. Yeah, I'll be quick. So Judith Hay, Director of Education and Skills in Newcastle City Council. So we've done a lot together, haven't we, uh, colleagues, in terms of partnerships across the city, doing loads of stuff for children and young people. Before the pandemic, Newcastle had a track record of doing really well. During the pandemic, massive stuff done together. City Lifeline, you know, thousands of pieces of kit delivered to young people, food, uh, food banks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We've done loads. As we come out of the pandemic, we've done even more together, summer reading schemes, holiday hunger programmes, activities for young people. So we've proven that we can put the glue between us all, even more so, to stick together, to, to do an offer for children and young people. I think we think the challenges are, and I think it's become very apparent today, we all separately do lots of great things. But how do we put that together so that young people can navigate their way through those different uh, different schemes? I can see a few nods there. So we do we do brilliant office separately, but how do we do it together in order for young people to say, ah, I can see my way through this? I'll give you a quick concrete example. I was talking to a young person a couple of weeks ago. Let's call him Ben. That's not his name. He's a looked after child. I think John and Chris actually will probably know Ben. Um, and what I said to him was, what do you want to be? And he's got himself in a real pickle. He's, he's got himself in a bad place. He's been expelled from school and he can't see the, his way to the future. And he said, I, want, I always want to be a bricklayer. So I said, OK, then. So um, if you want to be a bricklayer, do you know what you need to do? He said, I need to get GCSEs, but I'm not going to get them now because I'm expelled from school. So I said, well, what, what, what do you think you're going to do then? And he didn't know. Next week, I'm taking to an employer in the city who said, I'm going to take you to a place that we're renovating and I'm going to you can talk to bricklayers. We'll work backwards and we'll say, in order to do what they're doing and they're getting a good salary, you need to knuckle down, stop doing what you're doing, start getting you learning for your GCSEs, we'll get you an apprenticeship, we'll offer you work experience and we'll show you how to get on this path that he's almost given up on. So that there's something about how do we, and I think um, what they're called influencers, we called it mentors, uh, wh whatever it is, we need to help young people to see the aspirations. Joyce talked about, you know, helping young people achieve the dreams and his dream will be achieved, but it's a long route for him to get there. But together we can help him do that. So there's something about us working together for in, in terms of an offer. So if together can we say out of the thousands of jobs that we have, could we every year guarantee young people work experience placements of say X weeks, a, a multiple choice? Can we then say and out of all those work experience people, we'll take 25% and offer them automatically apprenticeships. And out of those 25%, we'll say half of them will get a job and kind of strip out all that criteria. That uh, Why do they have to fill in a CV? Why can't John and Chris get a job in cyber security or games design without having to find the way through all those different systems? So I hope that makes sense, but it'd be great to have future conversations about kind of putting the glue between us all and making that system a lot easier for young people to navigate. Uh, Judith, that's brilliant. And I think we have a convening role as a council to, to do exactly that, joining the dots, bringing people together, uh, making sure that we fill in the gaps where there are gaps and uh, doing everything we can to make sure that nobody's left behind. Uh, and I, I think hopefully, um, I, I guess quite a lot of people on this call will know each other, but hopefully one of the things we can do through these conversations is make connections between different parts of the city uh, to come together around a common purpose. Um, before I start pulling this together, um, I, there's one hand up, Irim, so I'll take you, Irim, and then I'll uh, draw some conclusions out. Thank you, Chair. Um, and, and just before I, I 
um, going to what I want to say, I just want to say a huge thank you to everyone that's attended today. It's been fantastic hearing all of the contributions and they've been very vast and varied. Um, really, to be honest, Jack, I, I, I could talk a lot about all of the different areas that we've discussed tonight and they've been extremely important. I have three children, two of mine have just started university this year. Uh, my daughter is doing creative writing at Newcastle and my son doing civil engineering at Northumbria. My daughter took a gap year and it was during COVID. Um, so I advise, and of course, you couldn't get a job, there were, you know, with restrictions and whatnot. So I advised her to apply for universal credit so that she'd stop using all of my money on mail orders and found that she ended up um, trying to navigate through the system to apply. She Alicia's a girl, she's a grade nine student. She found it extremely difficult navigating through that system. And then once she was in receipt of universal credit, um, just her experience of working with the advisor on a week to week basis, she found extremely difficult and, and almost discriminatory because she was just labelled as a, as a lazy student who can't be bothered to get a job. And I obviously she'd feed back to me. Um, well, she'd feed back to me when I used to ask her, oh, how's it going? And she said, you know, she said, I'm going to university. So I've, I've kind of got my life planned out for the next few years, she said. But I really feel sorry, ma'am, for, for those young people who aren't going to university and who are uh, perhaps struggling to find their way of where they want to end up in terms of employment and, and, and trying to work out their finances. Um, and, and this went on for a very, very long time because she couldn't secure a job um, that was only temporary and it was only part time just until she started university. So that, that's something to feed back, because I think the support that young people get in terms of their finances is just as important as the support that they get leading them into further education uh, and hopefully employment. The thing that I want to touch on. Um, really quickly is, is at what point do these interventions start? Because for my children, the intervention started very late. My son, who I think he had a, a kind of a career, career advice session just before his exams. And for me, that was extremely late. So we would tip as, a, you know, what my children would call as typical parents ask, well, what do you want to do, Danny? What do you want to do, Alicia? Uh, we would ask them, them questions a lot, especially as they were they were getting into um, the, the final A-level exams. And although my daughter had her career path very well worked out, my son didn't. He, he had no idea what he wanted to do. He was toying with with the idea of becoming an astronaut and going into to physics to become one. And I was saying, what? What? Obviously, you know, from a parental perspective, I was saying, well, but where, what are you going to do? Where are you going to go to a job? And his answer was, oh, well, I'll go to the States. I'll, I'll go to America and, and I'm saying, well, where are you going to get the money from? And, you know, where are you going to stay and who's going to support you? And he said, oh, well, I'll just get a loan. And it was very much like that. He was very relaxed about it. And then once he'd received his results um, and said, right, OK, which university are you going to go to? Where are you going to, you know, which course are you going to go for from the offers you've had? He narrowed it down to civil engineering and, thank, you know, thankfully for me, went to Northumbria University, which is where I wanted him to go. So two, two, two comments on that. One is I encourage my children to stay in the city because I'm very, very conscious about enhancing local economy and wanting our young people to contribute to their local economy in the city uh, where they were born and, and where they'll study. I, I don't have anything against young people going away to other cities in the country. All of, all of my son's friends have gone away, actually. He's the only one that stayed in Newcastle. And I find that really, really sad. I think there's a lot of opportunities in the city. There are huge opportunities in the region, but I'm not sure that they conveyed enough to our young people. I don't think Newcastle staying here is the number one choice that are that's being promoted by secondary schools. And finally, I just want to say that the, I, for me personally, as a parent, I think the intervention needs to start as soon as children start secondary school, because it takes a long time for children to find their way you know, from their studies in secondary schools to start thinking about careers and then start to join the dots of which subjects they want to pick at GCSE, going on to A-level perhaps, and then alternatives. We've already discussed that um, briefly. What are the alternatives if you don't want to go to university? And I'm not sure that we're doing enough with children at that age about the alternative careers out there. Thank you, Chair.
Uh, thanks very much, Iram. Some really interesting perspectives there. And let me try and do uh, justice to what's been a really rich conversation. Uh, and as I said at the start, this isn't about taking decisions, but it's about exploring issues and thinking about what more we can do collectively as a city, uh, which is committed to making sure that all of our young people have a future. Uh, so from some practical things, first of all. So we know that uh, Kickstart is going to be extended to March. So that provides opportunities to support employers to provide paid work experience opportunities for young people. So we need to keep promoting that. And also uh, we uh, hope to launch our apprenticeships levy transfer process to help SMEs take on the uh, uh, meet the costs of taking on apprentices. Uh, and there are a couple of funding streams about to start the Newcastle Youth Fund and the North of Tyne Youth Employment Partnership Grant Scheme. And hopefully they'll support grassroots work to help young people on the journey into work. Um, and then some reflections on the conversation that we've had. Um, firstly, I think there's something about the changing nature of work and how we haven't got generations of young people coming out of schools with similar skill sets and employers who are big employers looking for uh, the kind of skills that uh, you know, take vast numbers of people on at once. Uh, we've got a situation now where everybody is valuable and everybody is valued, uh, but the world of work is much more complex. And, and so that leads us towards a conversation around much more individualised or tailored support rather than, as people have, a number of people have said, a sort of one size fits all approach. Uh, I remember uh, 15 years ago, we used to have a really good service called Connections, which did this in a school based setting. And of course, that was one of the things that was dismantled uh, a, a while ago. But it's that kind of level of intervention uh, that uh, brings children aspiration and future employers together in a proper conversation. But we also want our young people to believe in their own future in this city. And there's a question that came through time and again, which is who's the loudest voice in their head when they're making choices? Uh, is it, you know, who are their influencers? Who are the people who are helping to shape their lives? And are those positive influences or negative influences? Uh, and I think uh, we can't assume uh, that uh, there'll always be positive voices, which means that we have to collectively as a city provide positive voices for young people uh, around the choices that they can make, but also uh, around the opportunities uh, uh, that uh, and ambitions that people can have uh, for the future. And part of that is, as uh, uh, somebody uh, said, uh, it's really important to feel part of something, feel part of an employer that values you, feel part of a city where you feel part of a community. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that Newcastle has going for it uh, that is actually quite uh, important. Um, there's also something for me around, uh, I, I, I sometimes say that my, you know, in, in shorthand, my ambition is Newcastle is an area which tends to have suffered from higher than average unemployment and lower than average wages, and I want to flip those. And that's a, that's a slightly glib way of explaining what success might look like in the future. But there's a traditional mindset that the route to higher wages is graduate level jobs. And I'm not sure that that's going to be the case in the future. Um, our next policy cabinet, we're going to be talking more broadly about net zero and the net zero economy and the jobs that we're going to create there. But if you think about the kind of things that are going to have to be done, they're going to be very practical jobs. It's going to be things like retrofitting properties or installing transport infrastructure, charging points, those kind of things. Uh, and those are the uh, many of the skilled jobs of the future. And I think there is a question around how do we get the right balance in our training and skills and education system uh, to both support the life skills that people need, but also the practical skills that, that uh, future generations will need to take advantage of the uh, future opportunities uh, that are going to be on offer. And I think that that's going to be quite an interesting conversation to try to flush out next time, uh, following on some of the themes of this conversation. But I want to finish with showing you something. Um, I don't know if you can see this. Uh, it probably actually, that's not sure. Let me, let me, I don't know how, let me see if I can turn my background off. Um, because uh, uh, I'm going to lose, hopefully lose the, uh, the Tynebridge uh, marketing campaign uh, to show you something different. Um, it's being very slow. I don't know if you can see that. Can, can you see if I do it like that? That was my first job. That's my McDonald's badge. Uh, and I've lost a number of the stars off there over the years. I'm not quite sure where they are, somewhere in the pencil case. 
But that job taught me virtually everything that I know about dealing with people, handling difficult people, explaining things to people in a way that they understand, handling money, dealing with work colleagues who weren't fully committed to the, the work uh, in the workplace. Um, I learned a huge amount by working in McDonald's. And those life skills that I learned at the age of 18 have stuck with me throughout my life. Uh, and so the, the, the point I'm making here is that everybody's experience in whatever sector it is, is important as long as it's enhancing life skills and the ability to deal with a complicated world. And I would say that working in McDonald's and learning a musical instrument were the two biggest important life skills broadly uh, that helped shape my life. Uh, and uh, I, I'd, I'd like every child, every young person in Newcastle, not necessarily to work at McDonald's or to learn a musical instrument, but to have the kind of opportunities uh, to be able to do those kind of things, because learning those skills early in life is something that stays with you for the rest of your life. And uh, just to relate this finally back to our values as a city, um, we need people to be ambitious, we need people to take pride, but we need our city to treat people fairly and for people to feel that they have equality of opportunity. And to do that, we need to make sure that there's a system that compensates for the inequalities that our economic system throws up and creates. So part of our role is to work together to plug those gaps. By doing so, what we do is we provide young people with hope for the future. And our city is nothing if it doesn't have the hope of future generations invested in it. Uh, so this has been a really fascinating, very valuable conversation. And uh, we'll be uh, we, we, uh, we've been taking notes, we'll circulate those around to people afterwards uh, and uh, hope that uh, we'll be able to continue the conversation about how we ensure that no child in this city gets left behind and opportunities are spread and available to everybody, uh, regardless of their background or the circumstances of their birth. So thank you very much, everybody, for a great conversation and enjoy the rest of your evening. Good night, everyone. Thank you.